and Sam Biggio from Win Virginia. And Win Virginia was our sponsor at the Women's Summit, as you may know. You may have saw a lot of their Virginia Our Way ads, and they have a great program uh, that links citizens to legislation down in uh, Virginia and Richmond. And many of you that what Win Virginia is great at is when people know them, like Josh, probably when you run for office, they really are support. They do a lot of trainings and so on. And Heidi and Sam have just been instrumental. And we go way back because uh, they actually presented at the Women's Summit and they are always into technology and digital and really believe that making people, you know, connecting people, citizens to government, technology was the way to go. So that's how we first met Sam and Heidi. So we're thrilled to have them today. Um, with that said, if you wanna to move to the next, um, we'll just do a little housekeeping, which is usually Robin's job, Robin Warner from Postcards, part of the Women's Summit team and Network Nova. Woo, hi friend. Um, code of conduct. Everybody knows we, we behave in the Zoom room and if you don't, we'll toss you out. Simple as that. The full, uh, for today's, it's an informal Zoom discussion presentation. Please mute yourself when you're not talking so we can hear everybody. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will get to those later. Um, and then when we do get to Q&A, just raise your hand. I think there's a little button there that says raise your hand and we'll look for that when we are doing taking questions. So with that, Heidi um, and Sam, I'd love to turn it over to you and you can set up and do the rest of the program till we get to the end. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, see me. Um, so just so everybody has an idea of what we're going to be doing today, um, we're talking obviously about Virginia's 2020 special session, which will be starting next Tuesday. Um, I'm going to set off here and talk just for a couple of minutes about what a special session is, what's to be expected, just so we have a little bit of a framework. Um, then we are going to hear from Senator McClellan and Delegate Cole, who are gonna talk a little bit about the political side of things and what's to be expected in the upcoming special session. And then we will open it up to a Q&A. Um, that said, if you have questions as we go through, please do feel free to throw them in the chat. I will try and keep an eye on it um, so we can address them potentially as they come up, but there will be an opportunity at the end as well. Um, I will also go ahead and say in the beginning, uh, Senator McClellan, Delegate Cole, you obviously have a firsthand experience in all of this and probably an even better idea of what's to be expected. So please do feel free to jump in as we go through this uh, and add any color or correct me if I'm wrong on any of these aspects. Um, so with that, uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, like I said, the special session, well, let's talk about what a special session is. So I would assume everybody on this call knows this, but the General Assembly typically meets in its traditional session at the beginning of the year. Um, starts in January, lasts for roughly 30 to 60 days. Uh, but the Constitution does give the governor the power to call a spe special session when it is required. Um, we've seen these over the years. Sometimes they're as short as a couple of hours. Sometimes they can be several days. But the idea behind a special session is essentially that the legislature convenes itself uh, to deal with some specific issue or for some reason of importance that needs to be addressed outside of the traditional session. Um, so that's what we found ourselves in in this situation. Um, originally, this special session was called by Governor Northam to adopt uh, or deal with budget issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there were revised revenue forecasts and basically all of the things that had come out of the General Assembly were suddenly in an entirely new light because of the COVID-19 pandemic and what it meant for the budget. Um, of course, following uh, the, all of the social movements that we've been having over the last couple of months and all of the issues that have recently come into uh, the public eye, um, we're also expected to deal with some social and criminal justice reform issues at this special session. So started as a COVID-19 response, uh, has now evolved into what might be a more, uh, a broader special session, but that is why it was called uh, by the governor and what we're hoping to kind of see addressed in the next couple of weeks. Um, just some basics, kind of the logistics. So as I mentioned, it will begin next Tuesday on August 18th. Um, the House of Delegates will be held at VCU's Siegel Center. Um, the Senate will be housed at the Virginia Science Museum. Um, and again, this is where I'd, I'd be happy to hear some feedback from the legislators if this has changed. But what I've heard is that 
the intention is for it to be in person, albeit obviously socially distanced in the beginning, and then it will potentially move uh, to remote or virtual settings after that. Um, I think we're all still kind of waiting to see what this is gonna look like, what the opportunities for public testimony. Um, I, I do wanna revise the last bullet here. It has been said that there is going to be the ability for public comment. I think we're all just waiting to kind of see what that's gonna look like. Um, but it will be very different than past sessions because the latter half may very likely be entirely virtual instead of fully in person. Um, so now I'm just gonna talk about a couple of the issues that are likely to come up this session. Um, I will caveat this entire section by saying I think there's still a lot of uncertainty, um, or I shouldn't even say uncertainty, but it hasn't necessarily been made public exactly what's going to be addressed. Um, like I said, sometimes the special session can last a couple of hours. Sometimes it's been uh, floated that this one could last as long as two weeks or a couple of weeks. Um, so there's still a lot of questions about what exactly is going to get addressed and what exactly is going to come out of the special session. But I'm just going to go through some of the one, some of the bigger issues that either certainly are going to be addressed or could potentially come up in this session. Um, so the first, and this is the obvious, and it is going to be addressed, is the budget. Um, so again, uh, in April, the governor and the legislature had to make significant changes to the biennial budget because of the pandemic. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the specifics here. You're welcome to read it. But the general gist is that at the end of the General Assembly session, typically the legislature decides where they're going to spend all of their money. Um, but as you can imagine, because of COVID-19, the state had less revenue than it was expecting. So now there's a conversation about what the state's going to do with those shortfalls and where those budget cuts will be made. Um, one thing to mention is that although the state had projected a $1 billion deficit, um, it came in closer to a quarter billion dollars, which uh, is a good thing. It was less of a deficit than was expected, but it is still obviously an enormous amount of money. And what is going to be done to cope with that is going to be, I think, paramount to what's going to be discussed at this special session. Um, next is COVID-19 relief. Um, this is a little, again, something that could go lots of different directions. Um, some, I believe, federal funds are going to be coming into the state. And so where those are going to be allotted is part of the discussion. Um, in addition, lots of different proposals have been made by lawmakers and nonprofits and organizations within the community to basically deal with a lot of the uh, unfortunate circumstances and consequences that we've been seeing over the last couple of months. Um, I do want to caveat all of this again by saying that we want to keep in mind that this is a special session, so it's not a full legislative session, so there is a chance that a lot of these issues, unfortunately, will just not be able to get dealt with this special session. Um, but again, these are all issues that have been brought up and could potentially become a part of the discussion over the next couple of weeks. Um, next, of course, is social and criminal justice reform. So uh, the Black Caucus and the Democratic Caucus have both put out uh, reform measures and proposals. Uh, we don't have the actual pieces of legislation yet, but we do know that it's based on certain pillars. Um, there's going to be a certain amount of police reform. Um, I believe the Black Caucus also came out with proposals for, uh, I think it was bail reform, um, parole reform, uh, marijuana legalization. There was different issues that came up in their reform. So again, we're, we're waiting to kind of see what the full legislative package looks like. Um, but there have been very serious proposals that I think are almost certain to be addressed during the special session. So um, this is definitely something we're going to see. Uh, next is K-12 through education. Um, again, this is something that might not come up at all during the special session, uh, but the budget amendments did, or the, the new budget shortfalls could potentially affect K-12 through funding. Um, this is also something where Republicans have been pushing really hard for school reopening, so that's potentially something that they're going to drive into the agenda um, next week. Uh, but again, could be something that becomes a highlight during the session if it gets a lot of coverage or could potentially not be addressed at all. Uh, with that, so those are kind of the four main issues that we've been seeing um, that could potentially or, or we think are more likely to be brought up. Um, there are obviously, like I said, a lot of issues that wh whether it's because of outside organizations or because of legislation uh, could come up. I just wanted to address a couple of them. 
Um, vote by mail and voting issues, we are getting very close, obviously, to the election. So uh, I know that was one of the things that was of concern getting onto this call. I don't know if I would expect a lot of voting issues to be addressed at this special session. Um, but again, I know that there's a lot of activism around it. Uh, also redistricting. So that's something that has was obviously a giant issue during the General Assembly, has become very contentious since, um, so could potentially surface during the special session. Um, healthcare, the governor's emergency powers, these are all issues that we haven't really seen take the main stage, but could potentially rise to some type of either a legislative package or even just getting coverage and being talked about at the special session. Um, so the interesting thing here is we only have 22 bills, and this was as of yesterday, I don't know if we got a couple this morning, um, but there are only 22 bills actually filed so far, um, and I think primarily by Republicans. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be more legislative packages, we just don't have them right now. Um, I think the last that I looked, we were expected to get a lot of the legislation at the beginning of next week. Um, so this is something where if you're really interested in seeing like what are the legislative packages, what do the pieces of legislation look like, and you know what are we actually talking about passing here, you'll want to check on Virginia LIS to get the updates, see the bills as they're being introduced before the General Assembly, or I'm sorry, before the special session. Um, so yeah, so it's something where we're a little bit, not necessarily in the dark, but we're still waiting to see what the legislation is going to look like just because we have so so little of it right now. Um, but it can be introduced before August 9th, 18th, which is next Tuesday. So if you're interested in seeing legislation as it comes through, that's where you're gonna wanna check uh, Virginia LIS. Oh, and I will mention um, before I forget, at the very top, I can add it again, um, but at the very, very top of the chat, for those of you who are interested, um, all of the resources we're talking about today, in addition to a lot of advocacy tools, so committee chairs, um, a lot of the contact information, things like that, are all, we put it all into a Google Doc. Yeah, thanks. So Sam just added it to the chat again. Um, that is open to everybody. I think you all should have public access to it. So if anybody's interested in any of the resources that we're talking about today, or wants to use some of that contact information for advocacy, please feel free to check that out in the chat and uh, look at the document. Um, so I think we are going to uh, stop here for the moment. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let Senator McClellan and Delegate Cole talk a little bit about their, uh, each speak a little bit about their perspectives going into the special session. Um, then we will open it up to questions. Feel free to ask me questions. Feel free to ask them questions. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, we'll uh, bring it back and talk about advocacy. Um, so yeah, with that, I will turn it over to Senator McClellan. You just happen to be on my screen. So I will turn it over to you and then we'll go to Delegate Cole. All right, thank you, Heidi. Uh, thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Um, and, and Heidi did a pretty good job of, of overviewing uh, the special session. I think the only caveat I would add is we're not exactly sure yet what's gonna happen after the 18th. Um, we also, um, there's a lot up in the air because we have not seen the governor's budget and we will see it for the first time when it's released publicly. Uh, Tuesday morning, uh, the governor will present it to the, uh, the, there'll be a joint meeting of the Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee and the House Finance and Appropriation Committees um, and so we will see it for the first time when, when you all see it. Um, it is very unlikely uh, that the Senate will have budget amendments. As a matter of fact, we, we were all uh, told that there would not be budget amendments, which is not unusual for a special session because of, of, of it's a, sort of the emergency nature of it. Um, I think on the House side, they, they haven't quite decided what they're going to do yet, but I'll, I'll defer to Josh to talk about um, the House side. Uh, it's also unclear whether we will meet in person the entire time uh, when we do our floor reads. We did meet in person on the eight, on the, on veto session day. Folks were pretty comfortable about uh, how we were socially distant and safe. Um, it's also unclear exactly when or how committee meetings will happen. Um, but everything we do pre-COVID and now is live stream. Uh, through the General Assembly's website. So be sure that uh, you follow that. 
uh, meetings are publicized in advance on um, the General Assembly website as well. Um, and we are doing public comment and making sure that whether we're in person or not, we have plenty of opportunities for public comment. On the Senate side, uh, we have a website, I'm sorry, an email set up, uh, public underscore comment at senate.virginia.gov, and I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Um, any email that goes to that will be sent to the, the Senate Judiciary and the uh, Rehab and Social Services Committee, which is where most of our criminal justice reform and police reform bills will go. Um, and we will have uh, other ways, once we know what all bills have been introduced and what committees they're gonna go to, uh, the best way to follow that is on the Legislative Services website, which I'll make sure I put in the comments. So yesterday was the deadline for um, legislators to request bill drafts. That's why you haven't seen a lot. Um, and we're also likely going to be limited to three bills per member. Um, but a lot of us have more than three things we were asked to carry or considering carrying. So this week is where a lot of that behind the scenes, who's going to carry what, so we make sure everything that needs to be filed gets filed. Um, so I suspect a lot of bills will start to be filed either at the end of this week or the beginning of next. And that, again, that's not unusual even for a regular session um, because sometimes in regular session we have, we have bill limits as well. Um, the subjects, I mean, you pretty much heard on the Senate side, um, we, we very quickly after uh, George Floyd's murder put together a subcommittee uh, to look at what needed to be done during a special session. And again, keeping in mind, we don't know the full fiscal picture yet. Um, there's not a lot of time to do full stakeholdering and vetting of, of ideas. And a lot of times, it's not so much, is this a good idea, but it's, is this, does this idea have unintended consequences that we need to identify and care for? Um, and you don't have the same kind of time to do that in, in a special session. Frankly, sometimes you don't have time to do it in a regular session. So we're looking at special session as what has to get done right now. What cannot wait until July of 2021? Because in, in regular session, new laws take effect absent an emergency clause um, in July of, of that year. Whatever we pass during special session, session ab absent an emergency clause will take effect in four months. Um, and there are ways to have it happen faster, but we're basically looking at this as what has to get done right now and can't wait. Where do we have some consensus already? Um, and then, what can and should wait for all the reasons I just said until regular session. So what can't wait is a very clear and growing distrust among the community that was already present in some communities, particularly African American uh, and low income communities of a growing lack, lack of faith in law enforcement's ability to to do its job fairly, a growing concern that we have um, criminalized poverty and over-criminalized mental health and addiction. Um, and so we will see bills to authorize localities to create civilian review boards with teeth, at, as in investigative power, subpoena power, uh, disciplinary power, you know, with an appeals process, you will see legislation to create a, a mobile crisis unit. Um, we colloquially call it here in Richmond the Marcus Alert uh, after Marcus David Peters, who was killed um, by a police officer when he was in the middle of a mental health crisis. And this would have um, a, a system where the first responder on the scene when someone's in a mental health crisis and, and a 911 call has been made will be a mental health professional. Um, you will see we've already filed our, our police reform bill. It's an omnibus bill that Senator Mamie Locke is carrying that includes things like banning no-knock warrants, banning um, chokeholds and, and, and other things. Um, you will see a bill 
um, dealing with sentencing reform and sort of what happens. We know there's a lot of damage that gets a lot of news attention up front sometimes when people interact with law enforcement. You don't always hear about in the news the damage done once someone has entered the criminal justice system, either at the trial level or through sentencing or through incarceration. So we will have some reform measures dealing with that entire continuum. How do we give our prosecutors the ability to be merciful, getting rid of some of the mandatory minimum sentences that have you know, unjust results, getting rid of some of the you know, reevaluating sentences where it's too harsh given what happened or, or, or given that there's you know, no physical injury um, so, for example, right now, um, if you assault a police officer, the penalty is the same whether you threw an onion ring at that police officer or whether you hit him over the head with a sledgehammer. That doesn't make sense. So, so these are some of the things that we're doing, um, making it easier for prisoners who, have, um, who can earn good time credits and be released early if they have been uh, model model prisoners and 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 really showing that they have been rehabilitated. Um, so these are some of the things that we will deal with. I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Um, we are also going to be dealing with. There are a lot of people who have lost their jobs, who have now lost their uh, unemployment compensation, who still aren't working. We've had an evictions moratorium because they can't pay their rent. We have had a utility bill, sort of a moratorium on disconnecting their utilities for non-payment because they can't pay those bills. When those moratoriums lift, they will not be able to pay five or six months worth of bills up front. And so we are working on some legislation to provide relief there uh, in a way that, that, that is fair and equitable and, and doesn't place that burden uh, solely on on uh, landlords and and utility companies or other utility um, customers. So, and there's some education issue. I mean, we recognize that this school year is not going to be a normal school year, and so there are some uh, some flexibility that we need to provide and some additional funding we need to provide to uh, our K-12 institutions and some of our higher ed institutions to help them manage that. Um, so those are the, the, the big ticket items. Um, again, we'll have the full picture once all the bills are introduced and once the budget is introduced and, and you should be following, you know, every, I'm pretty sure every one of your members have Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Um, you know, we're pretty good about live tweeting or live whatevering what's going on. And so uh, be sure you're following us. And, um, and I know this, this crew is very good about letting people know uh, what's happening as well, but it's going to be different. Um, you know, a lot of you don't show up in the hallways to talk to us anyway, because you're working or you're too far away. Um, but that's especially true now. And so be creative about reaching out to us now, early and often. Email phone calls, social media, you know, once special session starts, we're going to be kind of drinking from a fire hose a little bit. So the more you can tell us this week, what you're concerned about and what, what you want us to do, the better. Um, we may not respond right away, but we see it and we hear you and, and we're paying attention. And as quickly as we can, we will respond to you, but we need to hear from you because it's going to be, a lot going on in a short period of time, but we represent you, we work for you. So we need to hear from you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Josh and then look forward to answering your questions afterwards. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think Senator, uh, she touched it all. <laughs> but I do wanna give you a little perspective of what's going on on the House side. Um, so we will be meeting on Tuesday at the Siegel Center in Richmond, the VCU Siegel Center. Um, and from what we've been in discussion, discussion with the speaker, we will meet that one day in person. Um, we will quote unquote take a break and then we'll come back the following week to have our committee hearings. Um, and we'll listen and hear uh, the legislation that's up before us. 
we'll make those votes. And then um, we're hoping that we'll be able to do everything virtually so that we can make the votes and send things over to the Senate. Um, we will be releasing the House's legislative agenda, um, from my understanding, by the end of this week, I believe. And so you'll at least get a list of what we're going to be working on. And by early next week, again, like Senator said, the end of this week, early next week, you'll start to see those bills pop up um, on LIS. Um, the same thing that the Senate is doing with the hearings, we'll have a few committee meetings that are going to be, uh, that are going to meet. Um, we're still not aware what they're going to be, but just thinking about the topics, it's most likely going to be courts of justice, public safety, uh, the Speaker's Rules Committee, um, health and wellness, um, and I believe labor and commerce. Just thinking about the topics, those will probably be the committees that will be meeting, and you can watch them via live stream on, um, on the LIS website. Um, so we're still looking, um, how, I think this is so amazing for us that this is the first time we've actually been in the majority and had to have to do a special session where we're actually passing legislation. I don't think a situation like this has happened um, with in well over 20 some odd years. We've come together for a special session before, you know, to adjust the budget or maybe pass one or two bills, excuse me. <clears throat> but this is the first time that we've actually come together to actually do a special session. We're passing meaningful legislation. Um, so we're still trying to figure it out, but I'm really excited and I'm grateful for the leadership that we have um, and Speaker Eileen Philicorn, um, Charnel Herring, uh, Majority Leader, and how they're pulling things together. Um, so one of the things I'm working on, Senator McClellan mentioned, was a eviction moratorium. We're having so many people who are reaching out, and some are actually not even aware of the rent protection program that the governor has put in um, put in place. The numbers for that, we're seeing people who are reaching out are extremely low. So we want to make sure that number one, people are aware of that program that we have on the state level, and two, that landlords are actually taking money from that and they are actually utilizing that as well. So we're going to try our hardest to direct people into um, into that option because it's something we already have in place. Um, and I could assume that there'll probably be something else doing uh, to address that with the, the budget. Now, unlike the Senate, we will have slight budget amendments in the House. Um, the uh, Chair of Appropriations, Delegate Luke Torian, stated the only amendments he's entertaining are amendments dealing with criminal justice reform, specifically to COVID relief and education. That's it. So he said, if your uh, budget amendment does not deal with those three, he's not giving it a hearing and he's not going to entertain it. Um, so for us in the House, and I think we're working very closely with the Senate to make sure that we're pushing out the same thing so that when the legislation comes over, we're seeing the same thing so it's easier to get passed. Um, and I don't know if anyone mentioned it, but whatever we get through um, in, the general, in, in this special session, if there is not an emergency clause on it, Many of these pieces of legislation won't go into effect until uh, November, December, or depending when we adjourn, even as late as January. Um, and so we're trying our hardest to either one, get some of these things as budgetary language so that they get passed as soon as the governor signs the budget, um, or doing what we can to get an emergency clause on it. Um, some things, you know, in the House, we require um, a few more votes from Republicans. So we have to see what we can actually get passed with an emergency clause. Um, but that's what I have on this side. And so if you all have any questions or concerns, um, I would love to answer those. And I'll just go ahead and pop in here. If people want to, uh, I know we have a couple of questions in the chat. I'll happily read through a couple of those, but if people want to go ahead and unmute yourself and actually ask your question. So I'll ask one here just to kick us off. But if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question in person, feel free. Um, so the first question it looks like that we got was from Nancy Rice, who said, uh, with regards to law enforcement reform, how will the issue of police unions be approached? So I'll uh, let the senator and the delegate handle that. Um, you know, I think po police unions are a stakeholder like, like you know, any other stakeholder. Uh, you know, we're, we're here, what they have to say. Um, I, I think there's a difference, and we're, and I think the bills we are introducing will will provide a difference between the employment process versus the um, uh, sort of, you know, if they've committed a crime, 
that's one thing. If they've committed a fireable offense, that's another thing. I think they have to be addressed separately. I think they both need to be transparent. I think they both need to um, be, you know, on, uh, handled with some independence um, and, and accountability. Um, and there needs to be an appeals process. So um, again, not having seen the full package of bills introduced yet, uh, I think what we are looking at is what happens if a police officer um, engages in misconduct that that you know is a crime or would be a crime if committed by anybody else, and also what happens if they do something that is a fireable offense, and dealing with you know how do we make sure that that is done in a fair, transparent way that provides real accountability. That that's that's. That should be the case for everyone. It is the case for a lot of other professions, uh, even where there are unions. And I think making sure that there is due process um, will, will, and making sure that process is fair is good for both, you know, good for everybody. So uh, I think just like anybody else, we will, we will you know, listen to what they have to say um, and, 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 and account for that in our deliberations. Um, um, We'll see, we'll see what happens. Well, then I guess uh, anybody want to ask their question out loud? Yeah, yeah I have a question. Uh, I'm Stephen Spitz. I'm co-chair of the Election Law and Voter Protection Committee of the Fairfax County Democratic Committee. And there are two simple but very important COVID-related voting fixes that would be great to have happen. One would be to eliminate the witness signature uh, requirement, which so people like me who live alone don't have to find a witness if you want to vote absentee by mail. And secondly, is to eliminate the latter part of that by having authorization for local jurisdictions to have outside drop boxes so people don't have to rely on the mail to place their absentee ballots uh, in, in a drop box directly at the early voting centers. So those two things are really uh, necessitated by COVID. I understand that there has been bills on this uh, and I would just urge you all to consider those things because this is urgent for this election and I don't know that anybody on the phone call wants to have people uh, send in by mail absentee ballots that will never be counted because they arrived too late. Okay, Steve, let me ask, let the Senator, thank you for your question and we have another voting question too. So maybe Josh, I know a lot of people, Louisa asked another voting question in there. So let's try to tackle the voting. I know a lot of activists here are interested in that. So if you guys can tackle some of that, um, also add it to Steve's question. Louise Lockett asked, regarding 2020 voting, what movement is there on apps to ballot drop boxes, permitting uh, first time voters to vote by mail, prepaid, posted, all that kind of stuff. You can see it in the chat. Do you guys mind just taking some time to talk about the big concerns we do have about voting, if they'll be addressed in this session. If not, how will we address them? That'd be great, thanks. Josh, you wanna start and then Senator? Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's um, honest. I do know. <laughs> I, I do know we've had the discussions in the caucus on addressing this and making sure we put it um, in the budget. But when I reached out to Delegate Tory and to, to make a specific question about education funding, he's saying, you know, that everything has been completed, gutting it, completed, completely gutted, and they're still working on it. Um, and so I can imagine that there should be some protections um, in the budget, especially since during the primaries, the governor uh, instituted an executive order to get rid of the um, witness requirement for um, absentee ballots. I know um, some of the smaller localities, especially here in the 28th district, the city of Fredericksburg, um, they were directed on a local level that if any voter was to put an absentee ballot um, in the mail without a stamp, 
that the Postal Service was still supposed to deliver it to the registrar's office. Um, the registrar office also had a red box outside of the office that you could drop off your ballot at any time. Um, so um, I'll lean over to Senator McClellan. I don't know what you all have in your budget, but I reached out to the, t to the chairman and he's like, we're still working on it. We'll have something for you soon. <laughs> so uh, similar answer, but um, I did reach out uh, to the, the governor's office. Um, I know the, um, the grassroots coalition put together a letter, uh, which, which, was, which I've seen and they have seen. Um, and what I don't know yet is, is, is whether these will be specifically in the budget or if there will be legislation introduced, but I do know um, there will likely be something around um, funding and, and a clear, clear authority for drop boxes um, and, and sort of the security around those, I guess, making sure that they're either monitored or somewhere where they can easily be monitored and clearly identified and some education around that. Um, the witness requirement, my understanding is there either is or might be a lawsuit. Um, at, I, something tells me that the witness requirement will not be in place for November, but whether we do that or the courts do that, I think that's definitely um, in the works. Uh, I think we're looking to see if we can have funding for, for prepaid, po prepaid postage. Um, and on and staffing, um, you know, we did make election day a state holiday. And so there'll be a lot of state employees that have that day off. I do know that the Board of Elections has been reaching out to the, um, some of the, the state agencies, particularly the Department of Education and working to identify uh, uh, school employees, teachers, or support personnel who could work the polls on election day. Because our biggest concern there is most poll workers have, have been el elderly and at risk. Um, and then um, I think there's also a mechanism, working on a mechanism to, to trace and cure absentee ballots. So right now, if you mail your absentee ballot in and there's something wrong, you usually don't find out about it. Um, and But they are trying to figure out a way to identify those and contact you and give you an opportunity to cure. So um, frantically trying to, to get all of that done. Some of it may be in the budget, some of it may be legislation, but again, until we see the governor's budget, we won't know exactly what's gonna be where. And, and Senator, would you think that that would be COVID related? I mean, that would be probably- Oh, it's definitely COVID related, yes. Yeah, right, yes. so that that it could be just definitely emergency COVID related stuff. Yes. And, yes. I know yes. everybody is definitely concerned, you know, about the voting. And just, I think with all the mail issues and trying to solve those, it sounds like too, making sure we have the money to make sure the yes. polling places are safe, right? So we can yes. vote <laughs> early and often. Yeah, and, okay. I, and, and I just want to remind everyone, you can also now vote in person the entire 45 days and we are encouraging a lot of people to do that um, um, and, and making sure we have enough people and machines that if people show up to do that they don't have to wait in line for a very long time right and i would like to say our coalition led it, that's on this call we are pushing vote early we're just actually saying november 3rd don't worry about that date that's the last resort vote early and you know and soon um, with that said, any other questions, Heidi, you see, or that I have a quick ask? question. Please, Nancy. Are the uh, Republicans going to immediately get a, a restraining order and keep us in court till after November? You know, I don't know. I, I will just, I will say, though, um, Rita Davis, counsel to the governor, and our attorney general are um, very good lawyers. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and uh, I do know uh, the law firm of Perkins Cooey has been uh, helping as well. And I can't remember if they're representing, I think the state party, I'm not sure. But we've got a lot of lawyers who are ready for whatever shenanigans they try. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the only other uh, question I'm seeing here, Catherine, is actually yours, which other people might have, which is, uh, will the budget address funding for COVID testing and or an increase for healthcare workers? 
We hope so. Um, again, until we see it, we won't know, but uh, we, we, the Legislative Black Caucus, um, has been advocating along with SCIU uh, and a number of other groups for um, more PPE, overtime pay, uh, hazard pay, particularly for home care workers who are excluded from a lot of the relief that the CARES Act provided. Um, Again, I, I, I assume that will be in the governor's budget, and if not, that is definitely something we will we will push for. Um, but if you have nothing else going on Tuesday morning at hold on Tuesday morning at nine thirty, uh, that the governor's presentation will be live streamed, and his budget will pretty immediately thereafter be up on his website and the Senate Finance and Appropriations. Um, and I think we will be combing through it furiously as soon as we get it. Great, we also had, it looks like Diane Alejandro has a question as well, Diane. Hi, uh, I'm Diane Alejandro with ACLU People Power Fairfax. Um, we are very interested in the civilian review boards and making sure they have subpoena authority and and some authority to take disciplinary action. Uh, two questions. Um, two, can you still hear me? I don't know yeah. this one. Okay. Um, how likely do you think that something is going to be passed in this regard is the first part and the second part um, which is sort of the uh, the protection in case it's not um, can we make sure that this is viewed as clarifying legislation because some of us Fairfax has a civilian review board it's pretty uh, toothless, and, but we do believe we have authority if this bail, bill fails to go ahead and push them and we want to retain that authority or the prospect of making the argument anyway. Um, I feel pretty confident it will pass the Senate uh, because it's, it, it was part of the Senate caucus agenda. Um, and, and as of our last conversations, we have, we have 21 votes. Um, I'm, I'll defer to Josh on, on the House, but I will say it's also on the Legislative Black Caucus's agenda. Yeah, that's one of the ones that we are hopeful, and I, I'm learning not to make uh, promises, but <laughs> that is one of the pieces of legislation that we are hopeful should pass. Um, I've said this before, and this is not throwing shots at Senator McClellan, but the Senate is a little bit more conservative than the House. So when they released their agenda of everything that they were going to get passed, I was like, oh, we're going to be in good shape then. <laughs> so if it passes in the Senate, we hope and believe it should definitely pass in the House as well. Um, and I already know that some people are having communications and meetings with uh, the Civilian Review Board in Charlottesville. Um, and I think people have to understand the importance of having a civilian review board and not just an advisory commission um, to make sure that they have authority and power to do what they need to do. Yes. Okay, thanks. Great. Well, if there's no other questions, we can move on to um, Heidi. I'll let you wrap that up and, and, and then move on to this, the, the last phase, which is talking some about advocacy and what we could do to take action. Sure. Yeah. So, um, Senator McClellan, Delegate Cole, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, we're just going to briefly talk about advocacy and then if anybody has any follow up questions, we'll wrap things up and let you get back to your day. So I'm going to share my screen again. And, uh, yeah, I think we've actually addressed a lot of this already on the call, which is really great. Um, like I think Senator McClellan said, I think the biggest takeaway, from today if you are interested in any of these issues is get involved early today is not too <laughs> is not too early um and as often as possible uh like she said it's going to be drinking from a fire hose the general assembly is already a very intense compact session and it's very difficult to get things uh you know topics on the table that's going to be even more the case during the special session um so if you are interested in advocacy again my takeaway would be 
check out the document that we shared with all the resources, reach out to committee chairs, reach out to people um, as early as possible because once it starts, it's going to be very difficult to get involved uh, while things are happening. Um, the first thing, to, so just to kind of break that down a little bit um, and give you some practical resources, the first thing you wanna do, of course, is stay informed. Um, quick plug just for the work that we do, VA Our Way is an organization that tracks the General Assembly and sends out alerts in real time as they're happening. Um, so if you're interested in getting weekly or bi-weekly emails during the special session, session and then join the General Assembly, um, check out VA Our Way. Um, also, I always joke, it looks like it's from the 90s, but the Virginia LIS system is actually a very good, very transparent system. Um, it takes a little time to get used to for those of you that haven't used it before, um, but once you get comfortable with it, uh, like was mentioned, you can watch committees, you can look at votes, you can check out legislator information, you can read through legislation. Um, so again, I, it, it can be a little bit daunting at first because it looks extremely old, uh, but the Virginia LIS system, I would highly recommend if you're interested in advocacy, get comfortable with it, get used to using it, um, and that's where you can really follow along what's happening during something like the special session. Um, pressure points, this is just kind of, again, when we're talking about doing things very quickly, um, you want to think about who you're communicating with. So, um, like was discussed, the big things that are going to be coming up this session are going to be criminal justice, they're going to be education, they're going to be budget issues. So you don't want to be reaching out to, you know, the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee if you're trying to talk about an education bill. So really think about who your audience is for your issue and then trying to talk to those people. Um, the other thing, I think you all know this, but typically speaking to your own legislators is always the first place to go. Um, legislators do like to hear from their own constituents, and so I would recommend starting there and then branching out to uh, other legislators. But again, when you do that, think about leadership, Think about committee chairs, think about people who are in your subject area. Um, and again, check out the document that we have. You can find it all in LIS, but we tried to put it in a, a little bit more of a user-friendly uh, list so that you can pick and choose who you want to talk to. Um, and the other thing I would say is don't be intimidated by this. I'm sure Senator McClellan and Delegate Cole would echo this. Legislators, are more than happy to hear from you. It doesn't, I think sometimes people are intimidated by the idea of like, well, how do I say this? Or I need to figure out the specific legislative, you know, language. You don't necessarily need any of that. So they still like to hear from you. You can talk about your own experiences, things like that. So don't be intimidated by kind of the legislative lingo of everything. Um, this to be determined, um, I threw this in here just because again, if there's one thing that you probably heard throughout all of this is there's a lot of ambiguity going into this special session. There's nothing wrong with that. That's typically how special sessions work already. Like I said, the General Assembly is already a very complicated and quick process. The special special session is even more intense. Um, but the one good thing about this is because there's so much ambiguity, I think, as was said, there's even more interest to hear from people, hear what people are interested in, get legislative proposals and really be part of the process. So even though it can seem like a very short, very intimidating session, because it's a little bit more off the cuff and we're gonna kind of just see what happens, um, that may very well play in, you know, in favor for a lot of organizations that are trying to get a topic on the you know agenda or get people talking about something so don't be intimidated by the fact that it's a very short session um, and that we still have a lot of questions as to what it's going to look like or what's going to be addressed you can really use that um, you know it, that 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 can play in your favor and you can really push some things and say hey nobody's focusing on this who do i talk to how do i push this how do i help get it um, across the finish line so uh, definitely wanted to mention that so yeah, with that, I will turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you again, Senator McClellan and Delegate Cole. I really appreciate it. And I hope this was somewhat clarifying for everybody. I know that we walk away with still lots of questions, but I will certainly be tuning in on Tuesday and uh, hope you all will as well. So thank you very much. Yes, awesome. Well, thank you. And um, thank you for everybody for coming. We still have some, some, some news we wanna put out to everybody, especially our next steps uh going forward with programming for network nova we will be following the session and we also send out a weekly badass briefing um that if you haven't signed up you need to sign up for and um again i would like to say thank you thank you again to the senator and delegate for being so kind with your time 
and for with Win Virginia. So we do have some events coming up. And if Robin, Robin, would you like to unmute yourself? Robin is on our team, Postcards for Virginia, and she's put together, we're gonna to be doing Friday Power Writing uh, on the Zoom. Are you there, Robin? Are you working? I'm here, I'm Yay. here. In fact, what I'm doing is our stickers came in that talk about vote early, vote by mail, um, I get an absentee ballot, vote on election day. So I've been counting out the, this because we had many people write postcards before we knew all that was happening. And we wanted to make sure all these postcards had the right information. So been, been dealing with our stickers. So what we're gonna, um, a lot of groups have been doing postcard parties and we thought we would, we would do one as well with Network Nova. So we're gonna have Friday postcard parties um, virtual postcard parties, which are lots of fun, and we'll have music and prizes. We'll discuss messaging and have surprise guests. So as we come into the final days, I'm very excited that um, over the years, we've had lots of people help us write postcards from other states. But this year, I think we've got almost 5,000 postcard writers that are all from Virginia. Yay! So that is really exciting because what I know is Everybody who writes postcards has at least one friend, at least one family member, so that, you know, basically it's a great way of everybody knowing what's going on. So these postcards help coming and going, exciting the people who write it as well as the people who receive it. Can I ask so you a question, a lot Robin? Of people who are reaching out at home right now. Robin, can I ask you a question? So yes. if we start next Friday, and if I want to come no, no, this Friday. This oh, this Friday, we kick it off. Okay, this Friday. I'm sorry. I'm, on, I'm down in Williamsburg, still on vacation line. Okay, so I want to come, and I don't have a postcard yet. How, I mean, are we going to – I have to be ready with postcards to join this. I should be prepared, correct? So Well, if we ha you can get postcards. Any postcard you want to use is okay. fine. But we have gorgeous postcards um, that Network Nova is selling and they're all about make a plan to vote because that's our message when we vote we win so make a plan to vote we, um, and make a plan to vote safely so if you want to vote early you want to vote um, in person you want to vote by mail but so we have probably now what eight or ten designs that all say make a plan to vote and my favorite are the designs with maps on them how cute Good. is that and Stair has put in the um, URL for the badass boutique you can get there many ways. We have a tiny URL. You can go to networknova.org slash shop and see them in all postcards. And we have a slide. Go ahead, Sam, and put up the next slide for our badass boutique. And we'll put shop. Our stair is selling our shop swag. Um, so thank you, Robin. And we'll see you Friday in the Zoom room. And we know that voting early is what we're pushing. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. Where are you at, stair? I'm right here. I'm just trying to put in this badassboutique.org. So what I actually did put in the chat, hello everyone, what I actually did put in the chat was I put in um, tiny URL email for Summit that takes us to our email landing page and then our Badass Boutique is shown here. Now if you do actually go to the Badass Boutique, you will not only see these wonderful postcard options, but you will see a little teaser of our um, Kamala for VP shirts. So take a look at that as well when you go um, there and watch for another fundraiser as well with Pamela for VP um, t-shirts. So I think that that's it. I really appreciate seeing everyone, um, especially the legislators. Thank you so much for your time um, and everyone be well. Yes, thank you for coming as we say, and we'll see you in the Zoom room. So please stay in touch and stay signed up so you get our alerts and the badass briefing. Just go to networknova.org and you'll get those. Josh, Jennifer, stay safe, stay strong, stay together. Let's write, let's win, let's do it. All right, have a good day. See you guys later. Thank you. Bye. See ya, thank Bye. you. Cheers, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>